This is Grand Mix of DXT, and you're watching the Break It Down Show. Oh, come on. This is great. I love I love that I get to do this. I love that I get to celebrate your uh, acknowledgement from NAM as a hip-hop innovator. What an incredible thing. When So I'm a little younger than you, but but I remember when these things happened. And this is corny, right? But but this I, it speaks to how firmly embedded into my brain you are, e even though like we're, we're opposite coast. I'm West Coast or East Coast. When I swish mouthwash around in my teeth, I'm doing your scratch from Rocket. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know this for years. It's just my default I, way I do it, you know? I've and never, it's always music. Yeah, I've never heard that one before. That's that's a first. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I added it because music, look, when you're musical, and I know you're a musician first, when you have these things, there's music all around you. Uh, Wycliffe talks about that. He's like, in Haiti, man, there's music everywhere. Everything's a song. Everything's a melody. Everything's a harmony. And I think when you're born that way and, and you're drawn to music and you're from a musical family, everything, all these sounds, you think about all the people who've taken a musical instrument or created one, they've heard a sound that they wanted to get out. Do you, do you identify with that? Uh, totally. You know, I mean, just growing up around music and understanding that it's it's an individual's journey to express their interpretation of these sounds is what made it exciting because you, you make it your own. And and that's what enabled me to do what I did. Yeah. I, I, I thought of making it my own. And so um, my approach to the turntables was based on uh, not just um, not just trying to be innovative, but uh, um, what the right word would be, uh, just free, free with it mm -hmm. and fr yeah. free and let it take me where I needed to be. As a drummer, you know, I, I was conscious of time and rhythm and that's clearly what, what it translates when I, when I do what I do. But I was thinking of percussion sounds, the guica, uh, I was thinking of improvisation, like Ella, and uh, and I had all of that, you know, in in my my house, you know, the the these these uh, performers and musicians and stuff like that. So I was able to adapt that to what I was doing. Yeah, man, that's cool. I, there is a line you can cross, and I'm sure you've seen this in your long, long career. We um, we've had Sly Stone on the show he cannot turn the muse off. It just hits him all the time. And, and it literally drives him crazy because he can't stop the music from flowing. Or someone like Angelo Moore, who's such an artist, to his own detriment, he only makes the artist's choice. But to his benefit, he's always made the artist's choice, right? Because Fishbone isn't held in the regard that it might be if they had been a little bit more focused on being commercial. But they're like, no, I'm gonna play this gigantic saxophone throw these great parties, but uh, we'll let the rest of it sort itself out. So you can like hit that line where like it works and then it can become too much of, of one thing. What do you think about that? Like that line of being relevant, commercially important, but also innovative all at the same time, that's stuff to do. Um, you know, early in my career, uh, I realized that I was not really interested in fame. Um, you know, I was more in, in interested in expressing and sharing expressions. Mm. Um, and it, it was just, you know, a, a way for me to also escape uh, the environment that I was in. It, it brought me peace. And so, um, you know, growing up, I was more, I was uh, what Herbie would refer to me as a conceptualist. And because I constantly came up with ideas just to keep me busy and keep myself busy. Yeah. I was the youngest of four children. Mm. And so, and by the time I showed up, you know, the, the other three already had their, their system in place, you know. And so I had to find ways of entertaining myself, you know. And so I, I, honed the skill of uh, self mental preservation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we and, come. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in that, in, and in, in the, in, 
being exposed to music that gave me the perfect uh just entertainment and arts gave me the perfect uh tool to use to to uh you know express myself we come from a time when uh, there was so such a variety of music that was popular across a lot of genres you know soul music uh, you talk you talk uh, fantastic interviews uh, with uh, Fab Five Freddy and, and a bunch of other people about how disco was really the step before hip hop, if not disco was hip hop and all these different things that mixed together. Also, you bring in new wave and New York was the hotbed for all of this stuff, punk, new wave, disco, all of these things happened there in that moment. You weren't bound by a genre at all. The only thing that I think I'm seeing from your history is, is you're bound by the technology a little bit you had to pioneer how to do things. You talk about all these great things you talk about with uh, Sway and at Fat Five Freddy in your different interviews about having to, and I remember having to do this like before the pause button. Uh, my buddies and I would take our headphones and put it around and use our headphones as a mic. We would reverse the direction on it, right? Because that was how you got to record things, you know? Right. We didn't have all the tools. Yeah. You know, one of the things that what I'm trying to do now, one of my missions now, as far as the history is concerned, is to make a give a few things clear. Um, the, the terminology has been a detriment to uh, some some of the narratives that have gone down the wrong road, like the term disco. You know, we called our parties discos also. We didn't call them hip hop parties. And the term didn't have anything to do with a particular style of music. That came later. You know, one of the most famous hip hop groups is called the Brothers Disco. And that's DJ Breakout, DJ Baron, and the Funky Four MCs. Uh, Shah Rock, Keith Caesar, Raheem, and uh, KK Rockwell. And they called themselves the Brothers Disco. And today, you know, there's a, another guy from that time period called Disco King Mario, who Jazzy J, a famous hip hop DJ, was his DJ that did all the cutting and scratching stuff. And you they don't mention him because the term disco is in the name. And people think that that represented a style of music. So they did not play hip hop. And, and in fact, they did. And so that's one of the misunderstandings of uh, caused by terminology that's that's changed the term disco which which means uh you know record or a house of records or where record is records are played it didn't have anything to do with the style of music that was being played it became synonymous with the dance music downtown and because they called they just instead of saying disco tech they just changed it to just disco and so, you know, that, that has created some issues that one of the things that we're trying to fix, uh, straighten out because certain yeah. DJs have been uh, uh, overlooked because of the terminology. Yeah, it's easy to overlook things. A buddy of mine is Chris Thomas King. I don't know if you know his work at all. He's a blues musician, but he goes back to the very beginning of the blues and says, this is New Orleans' music. This is an American form of music. It's the old narrative was created by the people who weren't blues musicians. And so when you go back, like the term jazz was used interchangeably, but blues came first. And so they were the same thing. But someone got into the marketplace and started cracking it apart and started dividing and trying to figure out how to sell it. And so a lot of these guys, Tony Jackson, uh, all kinds of people, they have been left behind by history. And part of his mission is to do the same thing you're doing, but about 90 years earlier in the future. And then all of a sudden you start to draw these lines and you realize that Cool Herc is, is the progeny musically of, of these dudes from New Orleans in the 1880s, 90s. And you're like, wow, it blows your mind on how much we still have to learn about our own combined history. You talk, You've talked in some of these other interviews about all these different crews and all these people who were there in the very beginning. And maybe they added a little piece of the innovation that still remains, but we've lost track of them because of, uh, you know, just the business moves on and it divides and it decides and all these other things. My brother, Dougie Fresh, would say nomenclature. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, there's several groups that, you know, the narrative takes a turn and it drops off people in place. 
shouldn't be dropped off, but it, it takes that turn and yeah. then people are no part no longer part of the narrative. And that, that's one of my missions if anniversary is to establish the correct timeline and reintroduce people who played major roles in, in this expression. Um, one of the things that I, I really try to drive home now is that, and, and I get a lot of pushback for this, that hip hop is not actually from the Bronx. It's it, The music is from all over the country. And so the, the expression and how we've put it together happens in the Bronx. You know, mm -hmm. James from Augusta, Georgia. Uh, Dennis Coffey is from, is the Detroit guitar band. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it's very important for us to make these connections so we understand the, the whole picture clearly instead of isolating this expression that slowly happened in, in, in the Bronx. Um, how we use the music and the dance definitely comes out of the Bronx at that time. But uh, my research shows me that breakdancing, I've seen videos and film of it happening in the 1930s. You know, I've seen uh, the Mills Brothers rapping in the 1930s. You know, Pygmy Markham, who my mother brought that record, that's 68, 69. Yeah. And yeah. so it it is our uh, disconnect um from the history of what has happened before us is why the issues that we have based on you know thinking that that eureka moment is 73 when in fact that's our, our reconnecting and reestablishing an understanding of those of of those rhythms and and how we express ourselves in them clearly shows that that's just in the genetic coding you know and so that's one of the most important things that I, I think that um, needs to happen now is for us to take a closer look at what it is that we're doing and, and, and you know, how, how we get there. And, and the wonderful thing, yeah. is what makes Cool Herc so special is that at that time, at that right frequency, he reconnects us to those experiences in our time with the technology of our time. Yeah. Would there have always been a cool Herc, the guy with the right taste, the right access to records, all those things, but that guy have always showed up and not necessarily been cool Herc. Could it have been another dude around the corner? Um, I don't know. It was cool Herc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. But uh, you need a certain kind of genius in a certain setting a lot of times to, to have, to, to be the spark maker. Yeah, it, you know, it, there's always there's always that one mm -hmm. that sets it off, and yeah. you know, we we've all mistakenly said hip hop started in the Bronx. It was invented in the Bronx. No, we reconnected to it. Yeah, yeah. And, and the person who set the stage for that uh, is Cool Hurt. Let's look at the macro side of this. What is the importance of music in society? We have all this stuff that we've done during the Gen X era, right? And and we've seen and normalized all these things. I remember back when rap was going to be a, a flash in the pan, and we all knew better because it was too good, right? So what is the importance of music in society? Well, that's an interesting question because it it it, it leads us <laughs> down a, a, a very interesting road and, 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 mm. and unfortunately some of it is extremely dark. Um, we can see how it affects humanity. Mm. Um, we can look into, you know, the urban areas and see the destruction that has begun to translate through the repetition of, of the lyrical content that goes into the brain computer and eventually comes back out. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm sure that and I am the product of a love song, <laughs> you know, like most of us. Yeah. And, and so, you know, once we remove joy, love, happiness, and, the, and maybe you should think about things 
from the everyday repetition repetition of chatter that goes into the brain computer we we start to see the detriment in the behavior mm. and so that's the key to what music can do music is a tool that can shape culture to to help people to understand and find the best of them mm. to to assimilate for the community yeah you're a drummer are you a multi-instrumentalist now i mean i know you play the turntable or the turn fiddle as you call it well how would you like in your musical skill how would i liken it yeah like are you you say i'm a multi-instrumentalist i'm a drummer i'm a percussionist i'm a you know turn fiddleist what would you say is your i'm a musician okay I, that's it just yeah, i'm a musician yeah 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 uh, i dig it when you look at your ability to do this stuff when you were a kid, obviously being a musician informs, and you talk about this like time, like you got to be on the beat, you got to know where one is and do these types of things. But as a kid, you also have time. Like you said, you've got to like be your own friend a lot of time because your brothers and sisters, they're off doing their own things. And that gives you, I always think about like the musicians who are like, I'm just going to do this until I don't like doing it anymore. And it becomes like eight hours a day, 12 hours a day. And all of a sudden you're making these massive, massive leaps. Did you feel like you were better at this than your friends? Uh, did you just have a knack for staying with it? I know so many musicians who make a lot of money and they're like, I just kept going. I wasn't the best ever, but now I've done it for so long. I'm professional. You know, I never looked at myself as being better. <clears throat> I definitely identified as being different. And that was my motivation to be different. Mm -hmm. Because I was inspired by all of the other DJs around me. I would go and see what they're doing and and, and I'd be inspired by it. I was inspired yeah. by uh, Jazzy J. I was inspired by Grand Wizard Theodore, Grandmaster Flash, um, Imperial JC. Uh, Rock and Rob, and um, I thought all of them were great. You know, they were all good, and some of them were better at certain things than others. But my whole thing was, how can I be on the cutting edge and 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 still fit in? Yeah. But be, you know, how can I raise the bar? And so that was that was it for me. Not. I never thought about better. There's that competitive, we'll call it collaboratively competitive, but that thing, you know, that the bar is the example, right? And I love focusing in on these things. When you see the bar boop, go up, you're like, all right, what am I going to do? I got to dig deeper into the crate. I've got to get to that, whatever that, what is, what is raising the bar back then mean? And what does it mean now for you? I'll tell you, um, I remember the day I walked into PAL on Webster Avenue, and I saw Imperial JC catch good times, you know, Sheik's good times. He caught it at half the time that we all were doing it at. So we yeah. were going good times, one, two, good times. Then we sped up to good times, good times, good times. I walked in there and he went, good, 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 good. good. And let me tell you, after he did that, I'm talking Imperial JC. To this day, you know, he I would say he was the fastest of all of us because yeah. he was the only one that can do that consistently and and accurately. And when he did that, I had to leave. <laughs> I, I turned around and said, I'm going home right now. Yeah. So learn I can get that because I had a party the next day. Mm. And when I left, I noticed something very interesting. I saw half of all the DJs. <laughs> they, were <laughs> all, they were all leaving, you know, and I'm like, okay, I'm doing the right thing. Because once you saw that, mm -hmm. see, it, you know, the, the whole thing was you saw something on Friday. Everyone was doing it on Saturday. Very yeah. few things 
uh, you can pick up on unless you really honed your skills and you, you, you had a shedding process that enabled you to figure these things out quickly. And so that, that day, <laughs> most of us left. I saw Jazzy J leaving. <laughs> And uh, we all went to our, we, nobody said nothing to anybody. We, I knew what everybody was doing. They were going home to make sure they can do that tomorrow. You know? Yeah. And that's so, the yeah. bar. That's the yeah. bar, right? That's going up. Yeah. No, that's wonderful. And, you, go ahead. No, no. I wanted to uh, bless my brother, uh, Imperial JC. Uh, he passed away. Yeah. And he was one of, he was part of Cool Herc's crew, uh, the Herculoids. And he was one of the greatest DJs of that time. Yeah. We're, we're losing we're losing these guys faster than we can recognize them. When we first started the Break It Down show, one of the things we wanted to do was grab the musicians that don't get offered the mic ever, right? Or or they used to have the mic and we've forgotten about them. And you know, you talk to guys, and, and it can be anybody, but but you're right. We got to remember these guys as they come up and try to as much as we can to get to them while while they're still here and able to tell the story. Um, I love uh, so we had Egyptian Lover on the show. We we talked about the Roland Data weight when he got inducted into the Hall of Fame. And he's like, you know, my sound came because we just plugged everything in and didn't know what we were doing. And it was a feedback loop and no one knew what it was that I did, but I broke it out and I just go, yes, 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 over the 808. And people lost their minds because even the Roland folks are like, that sound doesn't come out of our machine. And he's like, yes, it does. And he showed them and then they programmed it in so it was normal. But these kind of moments, right? These magic moments where someone slows down a song, someone layers it in, and oh my God, it blows my mind to watch you guys mix and do all the things because you're so on time and you're actually playing all this stuff. What were some of the magic moments where, like, besides slowing down good times, besides, uh, you know, Egyptian Lover getting that feedback loop, what else is out there where you saw something or you created something that just changed that, changed the entire thing? Well, there was a, you know, every DJ who's on time must cue a record. They have to set it up so they can mix it in on time. Yeah. And so to do that, you had to rub the record under the headphones. And so Grand Wizard Theodore decided that, you know, some because sometimes you would cue the record and the fader would be over slightly and you mm -hmm. cue house that would be a mistake brand wizard theodore decided that that's no longer a mistake <laughs> right I'm, i love I'm, it yeah i'm gonna do that purposely mm -hmm. and hence we have what's now called scratching and so yeah that was you know i mean remember that leads to everything queuing up you know because i did all of that under the headphones but you know, and this is why when I started doing it, I was already so advanced. But once it was OK <laughs> to cue out loud and it wasn't a mistake, you know, it was on. But, you know, kudos and respect to my brother, Grand Wizard Theodore. That's his innovation. Uh, yeah. Scratching. Period. Done. Right. Yeah. I love it. At what point did your mom or your auntie or whatever say that she stopped saying quick? You're gonna mess because you know records were precious, right? Record players were precious, and so you're when you're not used to these sounds happening, it's like quit. You're gonna break that thing. It's expensive. When did you stop hearing that? And when did it was like go, go, go? And, and again, family of musicians. Yeah, I never. My mother never stopped me. She never said what I was doing was wrong or anything, um, because yeah. uh, by th by that time I wasn't using her records. I'm sure if it was. Her <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't be talking to me today. Yeah. Um, but you had to be in your mom and dad's stack though, right? You had to know oh, yeah. their stuff because they had great I, stuff in there. Yeah, yeah. Most of my first collection came from there and just playing. But once I got to that level where I was scratching and stuff, you know, it, it, they were my records. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I knew this, that uh, I, I, I would have to replace her records or if there was a record that I, that she owned that I scratched, I wouldn't got my own copy. Yeah. Yeah. Who do we need to make sure we mention? Like, you're going to get this Innovator Award, and we're going to wrap up on that. But who do we else? I know we talked about a lot of guys already, but who do you want to bring in right now and say, man, this guy was it. We need to make sure we don't lose track of who he did or who he was and what he did. Um, Again, you know, Imperial JC, Rock and Rob, 
Grandmaster Flash, Disco King Mario, Cool DJ D, uh, Tyrone the Mixologist. Yeah, I mean, I I can go on. Uh, um, Charlie Chase. These were all great DJs, you know. Um, Wiz Kid, bless his heart, he he passed away also. Yeah. Africa Islam. I said Jazzy J already. I mean, yeah. I keep going, but th these are these are the people who who uh made it happen. The the Collins brothers, Mark and Jay Collins, you know, uh New Rock, DJ Blade, uh I can go on, but these are the these were the premier cats that 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 put in the work, you know. Uh, mean Gene, you know. I should have had a list here. I should have if I knew you were going <laughs> to because I mean I can keep going, and but these are the people who you know the L brothers definitely you know put in the work, you know. But Clark Kent, uh, Blackjack. Uh, Herc, of course. Yeah. You know, uh, Red Alert. You know, I'm, I'm starting to draw a blank, but you know, there's 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 a lot of them. But yeah, you're getting it's, after it's it. A, it's a small group, actually, but there's a few of them. You know, it's it's a very actually, it's not a lot of them. It's a small it's a small group of people who who are the main cats to 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 uh, put put in the work. Okay, so. Another thing is that I did not clarify is that, you know, the, the DJ culture precedes what became known as the hip hop culture. And that has caused some confusion because there were DJs in Queens, you know, the twins, the disco twins, cats like that, uh, Grandmaster Flowers, you know, uh, there was also Hollywood who was playing for an a, a older group, Pete DJ Jones. These are great DJs who who were part of the earlier culture before the younger guys with the breakdancing and all that came along. But th they are all so um, important to to the big picture because they, the whole DJ culture precedes all of that. You know, they were playing that music, that that um, soul music, actually, that, you know, once it got downtown and the, the grooves changed a little bit, they started calling it disco. And then those guys got tagged with the disco Monica, and that's another reason why you don't hear about them, you know. Yeah, that was it. I just got, I just got one more thing for you. I want to, I want to show you this picture. Look at this dude right here, that guy right there. I want to talk to that guy, and I want to say to him, Ginger Baker, Pharrell Williams, Herbie Hancock, all these people are going to be your peers. You're going to do it. You're going to make it. It's going to be better than you ever thought about. What's that kid say to you, man? What's he say right now out loud? Jesus jerking on the Vajra. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he he's saying, man, you know, reach for it, man. Reach for it. You know, yeah. if you want it, reach for it. And uh, what you what you what you need is the is the the want and the desire to do it. That's what you need. And then execute it. That's it. Yeah. Reach for it. This uh, Innovator Award that you're getting from NAMM, the, the Innovator Award in general, right? Like right now it's hip hop. There, there are some incredible names in this list, man. Can you look around this room and you're in this room now. That's got to blow you away. The respect to all these people that you look around, all the past innovators. I believe uh, Carol, uh, Carol Kay was the last one. You know that came in and was the innovator. These are legends. Legends. You are a legend. I am. I am. Uh, I'm shocked, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I'm humbled by it because once when I heard that, I said, "That's the ultimate." You know, and uh, for me to be amongst some of the greatest musicians and creators and innovators in the entertainment business is, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I really haven't figured out what to say about that. 
it's it's uh it's I'm speechless by it. It's just humbling and and I'm really grateful. I don't there's nothing I can say. I can just quiet myself.